Um, what we're going to be looking at today is going to be looking at accessibility and inclusion, but trying to take a holistic approach to it, and not just thinking about disability and um, accessibility and assistive technology, because that's not, not a very helpful way of working. What we want to look at is how you can work in a holistic way to minimise barriers at source, because so much of the work that, that goes on and, and has gone on at universities for a long time and has been accidentally supported by the Disabled Student Allowance is this sense that people kind of work the way they've always worked, which actually quite often creates barriers, and then somebody pays for that person to have a ladder to get over the wall that's been created. And actually a much better way of working is to identify what the barriers are at source, to realise that if you do something to minimise the barriers, you, you help loads of people. And what we're going to be looking at in this first session is kind of moving beyond text, because higher education is very text-based, um, in terms of reading, writing, etc. And I want to be able to look at that in a, a much more holistic way. I wanted to give you some background, so this is the, the bit where I'm going to talk at you for a bit, but I think it's quite an important thing to talk about just in terms of the numbers, now you'll have a sense of your own numbers. Nationally, in terms of this, these are these figures are kind of the academic kind of year from heating. That was the the breakdown of different um, specific access needs and the number of people. And, and obviously, far and away, the biggest is specific learning difficulties, dyslexia, and so on. Um, and then there's this other range across here. Some of these, many of these are hidden disabilities, and we will be looking at those in a, a later session. Um, if you translate that to kind of national averages, it turns out to be around about 10%. Uh, if you look at actual individual institutions, now it, it does vary enormously. So some of the more um, agricultural-based higher education institutions and some of the more kind of creative arts um, are well up in as of 20% to 30%. So we're talking about big numbers. And then we're talking about even bigger numbers because actually what was really interesting was the dean who was sitting in the session was very excited by what we were doing and she said, I consider myself to have a disability because this is an English speaking college and English is my second language. And so I know there are times when I'm not communicating as effectively as I could do. And that's that's a very significant thing because actually when you look at, that's the 10% of people with a disability nationally, that's the 15% of international students, people working in a second language, who may actually be a lot better at oral English than they are at kind of reading something. So they're used to reading from right to left perhaps, Chinese students, uh, Arabic students, um, and here you've got a totally different script. Now they, they've listened to loads of English pop songs, they've watched loads of English American movies, so their oral knowledge is very good, but actually, in terms of reading, they have a very similar kind of print impairment and they benefit from the very similar technologies that a dyslexic student would. So, you're talking then about 25% of your learners will benefit from removing barriers in some way. And just very quickly, who has a part to play? Well, actually, it's not surprising, this is a rhetorical question, really, but IT and learning teams, library teams, staff development teams, student support and disability, tutors, teachers, lecturers, all have a part to play. You cannot have an inclusive organisation, and, and I firmly believe this, you cannot have an inclusive organisation if the responsibility for inclusion belongs to a single team. No matter how brilliant your disability support team is, or your student support team is, actually, if the other people aren't playing their part, then all you're doing is firefighting or providing ladders over walls that needn't exist. So, everybody has a part to play, but that is fundamental to this work, because this is where, when we go back to that first thing, and whose responsibility, that's where you, your work might be a lot easier if you're thinking, how will I serve this student, or will this, will this video clip or this podcast be help, helpful for my student who's got no motor control or can't use a mouse, has to use a keyboard and a guard on it or something because they've got involuntary movements. That's where the choice that your IT team make when they decide you know, which video player they're embedding in the web page or when they're looking through Blackboard and deciding now, is that what the, are the keystrokes that you can operate this with? That's where actually you don't, you shouldn't be responsible for that. 
somebody else should be responsible, but there is a responsibility for people to talk to one another, to think about it. Um, for the blind, visually impaired, um, I completely agreed that text, because of what you can do with it, text uh, generally can be made into audio. But of course, I haven't taken it fully to the end because there's still that it depends. Because if, as we were talking about, Tim was talking about, you know, turn it in is an image of text that it gives you. If you're a blind lecturer trying to mark somebody's turn it in uh, submission, and you can't actually get to the text because it's a picture, then that isn't any good. Um, but the others, you know, generally probably low, uh, you can do some, it will depend on the kind of interactivity. Um, and so that is very much, it depends. Video, uh, for both deaf and hearing and sort of visually impaired, uh, video is a big, it depends, because there are some videos where it's really strong on the narrative and the picture is almost just eye candy in the background. That would be fine for a blind person, utterly useless for a deaf person. But if it's the other way around, so it's almost like an instructable thing, this is how to set up an experiment in biology or something. Um, again, if you have subtitles, that would be absolutely fine. But even some videos are so light on their narrative, and it's completely obvious what they're doing because of what's on the screen, that maybe that's fine as well. So it's, it's a bit of a mix. Uh, but audio, yeah, totally agreed there. Um, the dyslexic one, yeah, no disagreements there. Deaf, the only, the only disagreement I had in terms of the deaf was the text, and that's where you, you actually, Jen talked about it would depend on you know, the level of deafness, and that's absolutely right. If somebody was prelingually deaf, so they are a sign language user, actually text is not a preference because they have uh, the language is so different, and the syntax and the grammar and everything is so completely different that actually it's rather like a Chinese person uh, you know, trying to, to come up to speed with material delivered in written English. Uh, they may be better uh, in a different form. Uh, typically, I've heard figures that you know, a, an A-level deaf student working in BSL is likely to have a literacy level of around about a nine-year-old, even though cognitively they're studying A-levels. But that literacy issue is, is because of the language. But obviously if it was just minor hear hearing impairment, that might not be an issue at all. When we put them all together, of course, what we find <coughs> is that you know, all of these are pretty strong. Deaf was strong in one respect, but if you overlay how we teach, Generally, you know, teaching is a lot of text, you know, giving people things to read, um, and, and a fair bit of, kind of talking in lectures as well, I guess. And so that's where, what I want to spend the next bit of this session doing is looking at the art of the possible, <coughs> because if you took a crude and or probably slightly stereotypical model, and I apologise for that, but it's nonetheless probably true for, for a lot of uh, organisations, a lot of student experience is you listen to somebody talking or you read the printed materials or ideally you do both and then you write some notes or responses on it. Now that is a model that still exists to a very large extent and this is the whole digital capability thing where all of you have a vested interest in one way or another. What we could be doing is instead of listening to presentations, if um, you know, we were using video capture more or, or flipped learning opportunities with little screencasts and so on, uh, so that it's not all delivered in the lecture theatre. We could be recording things that can be listened to, you know, now, later, replayed, stopped, gone over again, or we could be listening to things that we, we then tested on, that could be testing built into the session. Instead of writing notes, on things we could be giving people notes. So there are very different ways we can work, um, and here I'm talking about giving them incomplete things. It's so easy to give people a complete presentation, a complete handout. Far better to give them incomplete things where they have to do some of the learning themselves, get them to create the videos, the podcasts, and so on. So there's, there's lots of ways we could look at that. And of course, this is a bigger part of some of the work that JISC is doing. Um, I'll leave these slides, so don't worry about the writing down long. URLs, but this is a diagram on the sort of digital capacity work that JISC is doing at the moment. They've got a lot of guidance on enhancing the student digital experience, and one of the things that we've done is 
put in a section on delivering an inclusive digital experience, which is actually where you'll find the diagram that was on there just now. But this phrase um, that I coined recently for a Usizer event, inclusion is the oxygen of digital capability. That's a really important concept because if you give your staff the, uh, the inspiration and the empowerment to move beyond a, you know, talking to people and setting them reading lists and to get them really engaging in really exciting opportunities with e-learning and in the process you create a load more barriers is kind of two steps forward and one step back. And so making sure that inclusion is embedded in it is really important. And we're going to look at the pitfalls of the possible. So you've got your staff beginning to um, use image-rich resources, beginning to kind of go online and um, maybe even using GIST collections, some of the, the great resources that are in GIST collections, image resources, image banks, all sorts. But there are two issues you might get with that. I I would read a bit of text which I didn't fully understand and then there would be a picture accompanying it and I'd look at the picture and I understood even less because I just didn't get what were the main bits of the picture. It would have made such a difference if there had been three or four more labels on the picture just saying this is the important bit highlighted in, you know, with a white circle around it and these are the bits, be careful when you're doing this and so on, that sort of thing. I just didn't get what it was showing and that wasn't dyslexia or visual impairment, it was it was just I didn't get it. Um, but of course, you may not be able to see it, which is an even bigger problem. Lots of tutor podcasts, because the tutors have got really excited about kind of doing podcasts, but they're a real problem. So you can't search for specific terms, you can't navigate to a precise point. Uh, There's one of the reasons when you look at the evidence for lecture capture use, very often it's a lot less than people anticipate. And part of the problem with lecture capture use is depending on the system you've got, do I want to be going sort of forward a bit, backwards a bit, forwards a bit, to find the, the three minutes of the lecture I didn't understand? Um, so how can we navigate more precisely? Um, or you, maybe you just can't hear them. And the same with videos. Um, and I say, yeah, interactivity is, again, we looked at that, you know, great. It's just a sort of a statement of things that I have observed in my own work in this field over the last uh, sort of 10, 15 years. If you want to add inclusion value, you've got to be very careful, coming back to you know, the, the accessibility fundamentalist that came and put myself on e-learning um, many years ago, you've got to be very careful what your accessibility requirements are, because there are two barriers you can create. Ignorance creates a barrier, so if you get people excited about podcast video, work in different ways, social media, but you tell them nothing about inclusion, you end up having 10% you know, of your students actually say, I, don't, I just don't want to engage with this, it's really hard for me, just give me lecture notes. That's a complete barrier. It creates a barrier not only for the learning, but it creates a barrier for the staff enthusiasm if they then get complaints. Equally, at the other end, <clears throat> I have come across organisations where if you want to put something on the virtual learning environment, there are so many tick boxes for quality that you have to have that the typical lecturer pressed the time says you know what I'm not going to put it on virtual learning environment I'll carry on giving them handouts which is the least accessible way you could possibly work so having too many requirements or having requirements that are out of proportion to the requirements you have for other ways of teaching you know, do, do you have something that says how people teach with an overhead projector or how they teach with handouts well if you don't, then why do you have handout? How do you, why do you have harder barriers for engagement for a virtual learning environment when it's the best way they could be working? So you need to avoid those two extremes. And somewhere in the middle is about giving staff the right kind of guidance that enables them to engage without creating a barrier. Now this isn't compromising for the sake of compromise, because I would also argue that five years down the road, when you've got 90% of your staff actually very comfortable creating videos and podcasts. That's the point where, because it's so normal for them to do it, and it's so easy, it's not out of their comfort zone, that's the point you can say, well, you know, up to now, we only expected you to do a sort of paragraph summary of the main teaching points on a video clip. Well, now we expect them to be subtitled, or we expect a full transcript. 
And so you can notch up the accessibility requirement as the skill level notches. But again, it's about mixing and matching digital capability, digital confidence, and accessibility expectations. What I've got here is, again, there's nothing absolutely set in stone about this. These are negotiable, but they are things that need to be negotiated intelligently. If you're talking about text, I would say that somebody that is an expert uh, content creator, so somebody that is paid to create content, they're not paid to stand in front of a group of students, I would have very different expectations from them. I would expect text to be, ideally, in highly accessible format, you know, HTML or EPUB 3, um, or if that's just not the format that you're using for other reasons, um, make sure, PFD, sorry, that's just a PDFs, make sure your PDFs are marked up for accessibility and reflow. As you go down, if I'm talking about what I'm talking about as a novice content creator, so somebody who's employed primarily for teaching and learning, not for content creation as such, I would say make sure they're using heading styles and using unique link text for hyperlinks. Now, what I've what I've looked at here, then, and I think you've got you've got the key, uh, all of those key points are here. Referencing the key teaching points, if somebody does nothing else, at least you know, is that in the body text and. Actually, if there is no reference in the body text to the image and what it's showing, why is the image in there? I mean, that would be a question uh, I would ask. It's certainly a question that I've been asked in the past by editors, you know, in terms of putting images in books. Um, using a caption to explain the main points. Now, again, there's an advantage. Some people will automatically, and some, um, I was working with an organisation recently in Scotland, and their approach is to ask staff always in a Word document with an image in it to ask staff to put the alternative text in there. Now, okay, I understand why they ask that, but actually, because they put alternative text in there and they don't put a caption in there, the alternative text is only ever seen by a screen reader user accessing that. What about the people who are like me with Haynes manuals who would really benefit from a little bit of a paragraph that said, these are the important bits in the image to spot? So I would suggest that, I would go the other way around, I would say body text first. <coughs> if it's in the body text, it doesn't, you don't need an alt tab. Why would you? You could just, the alt tab, or the caption could say, you know, refer to, you know, description or refer to body text. Um, or the next thing up, use a caption, because a caption is available to everybody, whether you've got a screen reader or whether you're, um, you're just a sighted reader. Um, provide alt tag where appropriate, or a long description tag if it really needs a long description. Um, the, there are little things that can make a big difference. Now, this isn't uh, this is the whole concept of partial accessibility. This wouldn't help a blind person, but it could be incredibly helpful to lots of other people. Um, a traditional way of labelling a diagram would have something like this. Um, I live down there between the power station and the oil refinery. <laughs> it's a lo lovely part of the world, though. Um, a traditional way is A, B, C, D, E, and then you scroll down to see what's underneath that which is all okay, except if you've got short-term memory issues because you're dyslexic, by the time you get down to C, you scroll down to there, you can't remember what it was that it looked like anyway. Or if you've got visual impairment, you're having to magnify this, you know, you're sort of scrolling around trying to find the appropriate bit of the image and then scrolling down what seems ages and ages because it magnified to find the solution. Now, an alternative way of doing that, that supports many people is to use the pop-up screen tips. You can teach staff how to do this in you know, three or four minutes. You know, put in a, a dummy hyperlink that doesn't actually go anywhere except to the nearest heading, so that if they click on it, it doesn't take them anywhere else. But what it does mean is that you know, this would have solved all my car maintenance problems in a go, because I could look over it and say, oh yeah, that's, that makes sense to me. So simple little techniques like that, which I've described in here as using um, the words pop up screen tips. And then the other thing, uh, if you're worried about your red, blue, or other color contrast things, if you're thinking, will this work with a colorblind pe person? One of the things that uh, you can encourage staff to do is to look at it in grayscale. Now, it's over here, isn't it? Read color. If I look at that in grayscale, if I can still see the important bits in grayscale, then it's highly likely to work with a colorblind person because the contrasts are, are going to be 
effective. And so again, that's a very quick thing and to show people how to go to recolor, grayscale, uh, and then they can check that very quickly. Uh, but I think it's well worth you having a look at these links, coming back to these links later, because there are loads of images that you shouldn't put alt tags on. Loads of images you should do nothing with. You'll put an empty alt tag so that it doesn't read anything. Because if the image isn't saying, isn't adding new information, to put an alt tag in there which gives people dead information, and it's giving dead information to people who are already working a lot more slowly than their peers because they're having to go through a screen reader and access everything by audio, then you know, there's a very good argument for thinking, actually, I'm going to put you know, an empty alt tag so nothing will be read. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, this diagram centre here has got a really nice flow diagram that shows you the sorts of questions to ask when you're thinking, does that need a, uh, does it need an image description or not? Um, and it's got a, there's a downloadable book. The book has loads of example diagrams on it, and for each of those diagrams, there's a sample diagram, and then it talks about making this image accessible, and then it talks about different ways of making it accessible, or indeed with some of the other examples, it talks about whether it needs to be made accessible at all. Um, so really, you know, very useful, particularly if you want to have the confidence to say, actually, we're going to break the rules on this. You know, you may have some kind of guidance that says all images should be alt tagged. You may even run your materials through an accessibility checker, and it comes back saying, oh, you've got hundreds of, you know, problems because you haven't tagged up this image, you haven't tagged up that. If you know that tagging those images would actually reduce the user experience rather than improve it, then that's a, you know, that's a choice you want to have the confidence in making. You have to work out how are you going to avoid disadvantaging somebody that can't access it. That's the basis of what we're talking about. We're talking about how to avoid excluding people. And summarising the main teaching points of the audio, um, that, again, taking that Haynes manual thing, quite often you can listen to something and think, OK, I've just listened to somebody, I'm not exactly sure what the main points are. So to have even just paragraph summary or six bullet points, you know, here's this this 20 minute audio clip that I've listened to. What actually were the really important bits from that? So summarising the main teaching points, providing full transcript. If you're doing audio or video, clearly to do it well, you have a script. So that is your transcript potentially. And then when you get to the really expert areas, um, apart from all those expert things that I didn't know about, the geek speak there, which I've been kind of illuminated on, thank you very much for that. There are things that might be relevant, like tone of voice, um, depending on the subject area. I think the key thing that I would add here in terms of video, obviously a lot of it's the same, the captioning, the subtitling, do you use YouTube here? Okay, so... Some. For some, YouTube will have an, it's got an automatic captioning service, it's about 80% right and 20% ridiculously wrong. But the point is I've used that when I've done video clips because it's actually really good to have 80% of the legwork done. So I just read through it and say that's rubbish, just change that. Um, but it saves me a lot of time. But again, think of audience and think of context because I was a geography specialist, so I did a lot of field work. And one of the things that was great to do, and I'm, you know, I was kind of just finishing teaching as mobile phones for students and things began to kind of become more, more common. But I loved the idea of students taking videos on field courses and then uploading them to our um, intranet area when they got back. I'm not going to say to them, every time you put a video up, I want you to subtitle what everybody was saying as well. Think of the context, because if my students were uploading something that was going to last for three months until the exam, and it was relevant to a particular cohort, um, and that cohort had no blind or deaf or other people in it, why would I ask them to jump through an extra hoop, which would mean they wouldn't bother loading it? Far better to say, look, within this context, I'm perfectly satisfied, no one is being excluded. Um, and it's short term, it's not high stakes, so be intelligent about the compromises you make. Um, appropriate tools, 
This is something, again, where you need e-learning teams, IT teams, procurement teams, disability teams together. It would have been great to have had some people from disability support here this morning because quite often the things we've been talking about aren't on their radar and yet what we've been talking about is of fundamental importance to a disabled learner's experience. But the choices you make, so I know that here that you've got Chrome. Chrome has got some fantastic things in it. We'll look at that in the next session on hidden disabilities. But I work in organisations where they're locked down to Internet Explorer, which actually means a whole load of free assistive technology tools go out the window. Acrobat Reader, we, we've just shown you some of the things you can do with a good PDF. <coughs> there are a lot of organisations, as I mentioned earlier, that take their PDFs or their prospectus and they put them onto issue, thereby removing 95% of their accessibility. Um, Articulate Storyline, I did a piece of work recently where we had some um, materials produced in Xerti, some produced in Articulate Storyline. Articulate Storyline gave us more immediate flexibility with how to lay out pages, but we spent far, far longer afterwards adding human voiced um, text because Xerti works with text to speech tools, with free tools, with browser tools, and so on. Articulate Storyline didn't. So, do consider that. Do you? So those kinds of choices about what tools you use with people are really important. Um, but reading and writing still matter. And what we are talking about is that you don't have a monoculture of text. You have a diverse, mixed economy. On the other hand, you still end up using text. So you've got in here, you've got Mind Genius, which is great for planning and organising you know, essay assignments, etc. You've got my study bar that's got a range of tools, some of which we'll look at in the next session. Text help reading write. So you've got all those things, which are great, provided the student is working in this environment on this system. But what happens when they're working at home? What happens when they go on a work placement um, or when they just enter the big wide world? Now we've put together uh, a series of resources. So this is uh, tinyurl.com slash just read and tinyurl.com slash just write um, and we put together these these are mobile friendly resources um, you can use them however you like if the creative and Xerti toolkits if you want to if you've got your own Xerti installation you can zip them up download them you just um, it's very easy from the URL to get an automatic download uh, and then tweak them as you want them so you can update them. If you don't have your own Xerti installation, you can still point students to them. And what they are, there's a whole list of things, free tools that people can try. So that's, that's about listening to text in various ways, using Microsoft Office inbuilt speak, Adobe Read Out Loud, Balabolka that we'll look at shortly, inbuilt things in um, iOS or Android tablets. For each of these, they're all organized the same way, each of those Second level resources gives you an overview, it gives you some video clips in action, tells you how to set it up and tells you other things like it that you might like to try. And so, and because they're all phone friendly, so you can, you know, people can look at them on a tablet, they'll read size for tablets and so on. So, okay, how to set up, etc. And there's loads of those and we are adding to them from time to time as we get a chance. So there's probably about 20, 15 or 20 on reading, and different aspects of reading, listening, making text more comfortable by magnifying, reflowing, personalizing, um, on different browsers, on different types of documents, etc. And then the other, the other link is um, this one just right, which does the other way around. It looks at word prediction and voice recognition so if you go to things that might help there, uh, not quite so many there, but there is some brilliant free voice recognition around at the moment. So just read tinyurl.com, just read and just write, um, I think are well worth looking at. The University of Kent has, has embedded links to those directly in their student support pages. So they've got the student support pages and they've just picked out which of those they want. We've got a load of different guidance, um, but you can see that in your own time. So that's the end of that session.
people when you're interacting with your students, you wouldn't know if they've got a disability or not. You might have a, a sheet somewhere that you get at the beginning of the module that says, you know, these students need these kinds of accommodations. But broadly speaking, unless there's a guide dog with them or a white cane or, or, or an, an interpreter, um, how would you know that this person has got dyslexia and this person has got Asperger's and somebody else has got you know, some other difficulty with what you're working with? So, um, just for a quick reminder, just looking at the numbers again, we saw this last session, but just a um, quick reminder, 10% of your learners, statistically speaking, will have uh, a disability of some sort. That 10% is talking about those that have declared a disability for HESA purposes and um, for disabled, disabled student allowance purposes. That obviously underrepresents because there are quite a significant number of students that don't declare. There's also a significant number of students who actually have never been formally diagnosed. And depending on the social strata that you come up from, it is very easy to spend 16 years going through an education system and have nobody actually push for you to have a diagnosis and to be written off as, you know, they're just a bit naughty or whatever. There's also that 15% of people who don't have a disability other than English is not their first language. So as we said before, they will benefit from anything that you do to, um, to minimise that. Now, <clears throat> I, there's a really interesting report called Reading in the Mobile Era, which I just want to kind of pick this out because it's not just about hidden disabilities, it's about the hidden solutions. And the reason hidden solutions are important is because they are discreet. If, uh, if you go to any large institution and go to the disability support unit and go and have a look in the cupboards, very often there'll be a whole stack of assistive technologies in the cupboards that are very rarely used. And the reason for that is because if a student who's 17, 18, 19, in your case, 19, 20, 21, a student does not necessarily want to feel different and feel highly identifiable because they're sitting there with something on the screen that looks completely different to what everybody else is sitting there with. So discretion is important, and this is just a little example of how discretion is important. It's from a, a kind of very different but parallel universe. Uh, UNESCO had a, a big, I want to say big, I mean you talk about half a million people involved in this uh, project where they were getting free books that were accessible through mobile devices to hundreds of thousands of potential users in developing countries. And when they did the stats on what people were reading and who were the really massive readers and who were just occasional readers, what they showed is that <clears throat> if you looked at the kind of the um, so this goes from loads and loads and loads of people to very very few people. So we're looking at active readers. So these are the kind of bottom uh, percentages. These are the people that um, are only reading now and again. And then these are the people who are reading loads, um, you know, eighty percent of the time. And what they found was this very distinctive gender split. So in terms of people that are only reading occasionally, it was a very small number for women who were reading occasionally, a very large number for men. But as you went up to <coughs> more and more enthusiastic readers, and you went to the top thousand or the top hundred readers, suddenly there was this massive switch. 80% of the top hundred readers were women, only 20% of the top 100 readers were men. And so in terms of engagement and enthusiasm, it was very much the women who were in the fore. And then they asked, they sort of went through the, the results, and they asked and they looked at the logs of what people were reading, and they found out that the women were reading education books and romances. And both of those were culturally um, frowned upon in the societies in which many of those women were living. Uh, but because they were reading them on their mobile phones, nobody knew what they were reading. And so their incentive for engagement was huge. If they were reading them as books, physical paper books that were lying on the desk, and husband comes in or 
sister-in-law or mother-in-law comes in and says, what are you reading? You know, uh, um, why are you reading that? That's an argument you don't want to have. Exactly the same things about discretion apply with disabled learners. If I can be using the same browser as everybody else, and there's a tool on that browser that really helps me, but that tool is equally available for other people, and it's not labelled, you know, if you are disabled, try using this, but it's labelled, here's a productivity tool. As an 18, 19, 20 year old, I'm really happy to be associated with productivity tools, because that's pretty cool. I'm not necessarily very happy to be associated with a tool that is um, labelled disability or assistive technology. So, there are four bunches of hidden solutions that I want to look at. Um, we can start hidden in the pocket, hidden in the browser, hidden in plain sight, hidden by your influence. Right, hidden in the pocket, this is where I think it would be worth people getting their phones out, because you probably won't have come across some of these before. What do you notice down in the top, sorry, bottom left of the screen, and whether you're on an Android device, an Apple device, etc., you should find this down next to the left of the keyboard. Um, on an Apple device, it's just a microphone. On an Android device, which I can't show you because I can't make it plug through here. Um, hello, I am near Stoke on Trent at the University of Kiel on a very sunny day. Okay, so that is how quickly and easily I can. I can get writing done. Now, that as a starting point I think is really important because you are currently paying quite a lot of money for Dragon Dictate for your licenses across the university. Now, I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think for some learners that's, it's a really good, it's a very fully featured tool. It's a great tool. But how many of your learners that might not actually want to learn how to use Dragon Dictate and not, might not want to have to kind of work through all the menu. I use it daily, so I'm not knocking it in any way. But how many of your learners might actually have never discovered that? How many of you have used that before? The microphone on there for the right so Matt has that Russ yeah, so a few of you have. But and I think for a lot of people that wouldn't be a daily thing that you'd want to do. But for somebody with dyslexia, that may very well be. Or for somebody who um, somebody who has very good spoken English but whose written English is a lot slower, again different language backgrounds, that might be a really effective solution. And so you are not necessarily the source of all solutions, it's very often a question of being able to communicate that the source exists and making the learners independent in doing that. And then the question is, well, who in your organisation would be responsible for letting people know about that? Is it disability support people? But then if it comes from them, is that only targeting a few people? Is that going to completely miss all your international students? Or is it something that's entirely different that should be handled by study skills? But then if it's handled by study skills, you might miss some of your disabled students who kind of go directly to disability support. So think about that. Word prediction, obviously that's built in. If you've done any typing on the phone, you'll realise that you know, the word prediction comes up for better or for worse. Um, those that are underlined, in fact we've updated this since then, we've got, um, I, I mentioned in the last session, under just read, just write, those little um, interactive uh, guides that show you a you know, quick overview, how it works, um, where to get it, and how to do it. And we've got guides for all of those. I think we've now got Apple text-to-speech, I think we've got Android text-to-speech in there as well. And then there are specific apps. Obviously, you could go into a whole realm of apps. The whole thing about doing this is that you're not giving people a specific, completely different device. You know, they're doing it on their phone. It's that discrete thing. Again, coming back to that, that um, survey with use of e-readers on phones. So there's a whole bunch of inbuilt things that can really be very effectively promoted to students and, and could save you an awful lot of hassle because we can save the disability department a lot of hassle as well because the more independent students are, the more you can focus on the students with the higher needs. Uh, and ultimately, um, the best support you can give a student is to make themselves supporting. So, what I'm going to look at quickly now is Google Chrome. There is this fantastic 
text-to-speech tool here, which is the Claro Read um, toolbar. I, it's fantastic because it allows me to do lots of different things. I can set up colours and, and all sorts. But the thing that slightly annoys me is that you can't get rid of it without uninstalling it. But it's got a good quality voice, so... The texter shows the best performance for businesses and offers new rights to employees, he told the newspaper. Protesters clashed with... Okay, and that will carry on reading down paragraph by paragraph, so I can just click at the beginning, I can listen to it, stop it whenever I want. Really simple and easy to use, but it does annoy me that I can't get rid of it. Um, so that's the Claro read. I don't suggest that you install that for that precise reason, that it's a bit annoying. Um, but there are other text-to-speech tools that you can add. So I can read the selected text. This is, this is Chrome Speak. There are concerns that 2016 Euro football championships. And then the Speak It, which is another one. So I've got... Concerns the Euro 2016 football championships, which brings us to next week, may be disrupted. Tourists and chiefs in Paris have warned that the unrest is putting off the theories to one of the world's top destinations. Well, I, regret it. <laughs> I do regret that. <laughs> what you heard there was three very different voices from three very different tools. And the students are potentially, I mean, maybe on their own machines, we'll, we'll have a look at installing something in a minute for you here. But the students potentially can have text to speech on any web related content. That means Blackboard is now accessible by text to speech. Um, if you've got that installed, it means you know, the internet is largely accessible by text to speech. Okay, what was it just today? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, mindfulness, pain. Yeah. Now, we only looked at a couple of paragraphs there, but it's a way where somebody can be, they're focusing on one word at a time. A student has Google Docs. Google Docs, now under tools, has a voice typing option, which works really, really well. Again, tip two, there's this voice note too which is a really nice little tool. Voice Note 2, I think, is based on the same Google Docs speech engine. But that's a way students can very quickly, just within the browser, do the drag and dictate kind of stuff. And once they've got that, they can then copy that, paste it into whatever they want. On this slide, again, you can have these slides to keep with. There's, there are others that we haven't looked at yet, high contrast, for example. But the ease with which you plug them in. It's just so simple, as you found earlier when you downloaded one, that it's definitely well worth knowing. Um, I put this one in, we've kind of covered that earlier already, so I won't go over it now, but again, I think it's often worth making sure that somewhere, somehow, in the way you work with staff and the way you work with students, they know the basics that are already built in. So, very few people that I talk to know that Word from 2010 onwards has got text-to-speech in it because it isn't under the menu like we talked about before. But pop that into the quick access toolbar and you speech enable every Word document that a student ever reads. Um, the web layout view, we showed that when we were showing how you can increase magnification without having to scroll left and right if you put it in web layout view first. So that's really good for visual impairment. Far better than magnification software that could commits you to having to sort of scroll far to the left, scroll to the right, move up and down, and get entirely lost. And then the navigation pane, which depends totally on the staff knowing to create the document in the first place using the heading styles. So those are hidden in plain sight. They're things that are there for everyone that um, people don't always know about. And the last thing, I know you've got my study bar on your network. At least I was told you had my study bar on your network. Um, these are some of the tools that are on my study bar. And here, what I'm talking about, I'm, you know, we haven't got time now to go and play with the different tools, but just briefly, XMind does uh, mind mapping. Also, it allows you to export that mind mapping to a structured web page. Now, you might think, actually, that's not terribly useful. But the point is, if you go to Word, you can open that web page in Word, save it as a Word document. So you go from a totally visual mind map with notes under the appropriate headings 
export it to a structured web page, um, open it in Word, and then you have three quarters of your essay already created just from a visual document. Uh, essays overlays are color, screen color overlays, so that's useful for people with dyslexia very often. This is a word prediction, DICOM, really simple word prediction tool, uh, useful for all kinds of purposes, uh, especially for teaching English, I've found, because of the way, if I, if I wrote T-E-C-H, it would come up with technology, technique, a whole list of sort of cognate-related words. So that's been used in the prison service for basic English teaching. Balabolka, text to speech, text to MP3, clipboard reader, um, and view bars, and navigation aid if you're dyslexic and it's difficult to sort of automatically read the text. When you move from the screen to write a note, and then you move back to the screen, you're kind of lost where you are. It can take ages to find it again. View bar is just like a, an on-screen, the equivalent of a, like a thumb that just you stick on the, stick the thumb there, that's the line I got to, and then you go away and do something else and you come back, and it, but it's a sort of technological equivalent. The key thing about this is if those are sold as assistive technologies, you'll get very, people, very few people using them. If those are sold as productivity tools, and on your you know, student support pages or something, you've got a, a section that says productivity. You know, here are ways that you can think differently, plan essays differently, um, you know, rest your eyes, if, you know, if you've been reading for too long on screen, get help with um, spelling and you know, with typing, in fact, because if you've got a 14 letter word and after the first three characters that you typed in, it's predicted it, you just press the F1 key and, and it goes in, um, and so on. So the key thing there is about actually keeping them hidden, not hidden from view, but hidden from association, that they don't become associated with the stigma of I've got a disability and therefore I have to use this tool. It's, you know, I'm a really savvy student who wants to be kind of efficient, which I call organised laziness. That's a really nice definition of efficiency. I want to be organised and lazy, so I'm going to use these productivity tools. Um, and that's it really for that session. So I hope that's been useful and given you things to know about that maybe you haven't sort of known about. The most important thing to think about though is these exist. We've got guidance on lots of those um, in our Just Read, Stroke, Just Write pages that I've talked about already. Um, I think it's worth you having a look at those, but the most important consideration that you have to go away with, and the biggest challenge that I, I can give you, is how do staff and students find out about this? I can't do anything about that. That's an internal is it anything from marketing to staff development to even course design? You know, is there a point when you're creating new modules that the module accreditation process might include something on you know, supporting students in productivity? Okay, you've seen enough of, of this now to see the gist of it. The guy is paralysed from the neck down. He's playing online pool with people all across the world. He's, he's very much into this. He's a very good player, he's got all kinds of people. The people that he's playing with, the people that he's very often wiping the floor with, have not got a clue that this guy is paralysed from the neck downwards and he's doing it all by voice. And the thing about social media is that, by its very nature, it's mediated through technology. And because of that, these assistive technologies suddenly come into play. Now that's a sort of extreme example. That's somebody playing online pool or billiards or whatever it is, um, <clears throat> in a sort of social context. That's not particularly teaching and learning. But here's a Twitter. It's not a Twitter stream as such. I've copied and pasted from various people on Twitter that I follow. Within that group, there's uh, 
profoundly deaf person, there's a completely blind person, there's a dyslexic person, there's somebody with Asperger's, but who's who? No idea. You cannot tell. You might tell if somebody was saying, I'm just taking a guide dog for a checkup this week, but other than that, following the Twitter stream, you have completely made disabilities invisible. And so, this is a really important, almost a cultural thing. You know, we haven't really talked about assistive technology very much today. We haven't really talked about um, disability a huge amount. We already have a bit in the first session, but I think one of the things that's really important to grasp is this sense that inclusive practice is about culture change. It's, it's more about culture change than it's about anything else. Um, so social media benefits for students. There's about six or seven benefits I want to go through and then we'll, we'll get on to you using the things we've looked at to start thinking about how you would meet any of those particular personas, uh, individual needs. So the first one was invisibility. The second one is because it's about social media, it is about media. So this is where, you know, when we got our phones, for example, um, or the tablets, pads, etc. There are all kinds of apps and tools that we can use that will allow me, as a student, to move beyond that um, monoculture of text we talked about this morning and play to my strengths in terms of other media. So just you know, you, using my iPad, my phone, etc., I can go into, <coughs> go into the camera, I can take pictures of things, I can record video clips, I can do sound recordings. Um, instantly, or I can do what we were showing this morning, I can you know, get the voice recognition on and I can speak and turn things into text, uh, which might be a way of me taking part in a Twitter screen or a discussion. So it's about the media, and so this again depends on you culturally. It's very interesting to, to be able to say to you, how many of you have alternative assessments for disabled students? How many of you have had to make an alternative assessment? You would imagine that if you're going to make an alternative assessment for a disabled student, maybe there's a way you kind of think beyond that and say, why is it that we would say that you know, our assessment for this module is, is a 3,000 word assignment or something, but if you are severely dyslexic or you're blind, you can do a different thing. You might do a podcast or a dyslexic student, you might say, well, you can do a video clip. What would be very interesting is to say, well, why don't we just have alternative assessments that are equally weighted um, and have been designed to be you know, equally valid in terms of your academic criteria? Um, the York Hull Medical School, several years ago now, probably that's seven years ago, they did a project where, with their medical students, there was a part of the course where um, <clears throat> people were doing something about appropriate think the bedside manner type things, you know, it was that professional bit about how you work with people, how you work with you know, conveying bad news and, and all the ethical things behind that. That used to be summarised by a, a written assignment full of research quotes and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and one year they decided that they would some they would do a different assignment. They actually set a completely different assignment where you had to create a five minute video clip that highlighted the key ideas that had been communicated in that course. And what was very interesting is when they did that, if you plotted a graph of um, student achievement under the assignment, the 3,000 word assignment um, assessment, if you spotted a graph of student achievement, you would find that the dyslexic students clustered near the bottom. Not because they were worse doctors or had worse practice, but they found it more difficult to, to really effectively convey their knowledge. When they changed to the other assessment, and then they plotted where the dyslexic students were, it was, they became invisible. There wasn't a cluster of them down near the bottom. Some of them were right at the top, some of them were in the middle, some of them at the bottom. And actually what you had done is suddenly you'd enabled those who had higher level skills in the subject to float up to the top where their skills deserved. And some of the people that were brilliant on the essay type were right down near the bottom because they just didn't have the, the skill set to be able to say, actually I could put this together really effectively as a video clip. So that, that was a really interesting piece of work, but it does make you think, what's the potential within any of our courses that you, you run here about just revisiting assessments, saying, well, 
instead of saying, yes, it's going to be a video clip, or it's going to be a podcast, or it's going to be a blog, or it's going to be this, that, or the other, why couldn't you just have alternative assessments where people could play to their strengths? And if you're, again, we talk about an international student, if you're an international student, and actually writing in English for 3,000 words is a really difficult way for me to work, but I could brilliantly do your podcast, or I could do the most amazing animation that would illustrate these complex ideas. Well, that's, that's a challenge, really. If you allow people to use different media, do you allow people to excel in ways they weren't able to before? <coughs> well, the other thing we already looked at this morning is the social media, uh, number three, is about smart devices. And so, uh, this, is, what's this? this is one of the apps, I can't remember which app it is, it's one of the apps on my iPad for creating um, content, and I can put the text in using the inbuilt voice recognition, I've got text to speech, I've got photo, audio, colour changes, magnification, and um, not just text to speech to read back things, voice to text to put things in. So that is a way that immediately social media almost by default means you're using the learner's own devices, you're talking about familiarity, you're talking about their skills um, to be able to, to build on the inbuilt features there. Okay, um, fourth benefit, if you're using social media, you are, um, well there's no point using social media on an entirely individual basis, you're using it as part of a group, it really lends itself to collaborative working. And collaborative working lends itself to <coughs> what you could call a division of labour, so that I could say, well actually I'm really good, at, you know, I'm, I'm good at photography, I'm good at whatever, um, so I'll do the photographic bit of this, somebody else will do the research, somebody else will maybe um, put together the, the presentation that we're going to do at the end of it. And so if you're working with a deaf person who's actually really good at visuals, that's great, that could be the bit that they do. Um, if you're talking about a blind person who's really going to be useless on the visuals but is pretty hot on their screen reader to go and to research the papers, then that's what they do. Benefit number five, social media is about geography, free communication, seeing the big picture. Now, again, going back to when I was a geography uh, tutor, I would often find myself in a position where we had students out in the field all day and they're all in different places, they're taking recordings and nobody has a sense of the big picture. The only thing that any individual has is this sense of what's going on, where they've taken their notes. We'd have a laptop with a spreadsheet on it, and they would come out, and some of the dyslexic students would, would show you their scruffy notes, which were kind of on several bits of paper because they hadn't been very organised. And they would say, you know, pH here was 9.3. And I would say, 9.3? This is an acid mine. What happened to be 9.3? Oh, maybe it was 3.9. And so you get those sorts of things where there's no error checking, there's, um, people can't read their notes. So often people wouldn't be able to read the notes they're taking in the day. And only maybe at 10 o'clock at night when you had kind of sorted out those problems and you've begun to pull together the big picture, you showed them the results, you put the spreadsheet on the screen, drew a graph or something, and you could see the big picture. Well, how much easier if you've got people here, there and everywhere filling it into a Google form directly on their phone and seeing the graph of the Google form, which is on another tab on their browser, seeing that graph emerge directly, or seeing these things appear on the Google map, or just watching their Twitter stream with a particular hashtag for your trip, and seeing what people are bringing in from different places, so that you can see it all as it comes, and you can think through it. For many dyslexic people, for people who like that kind of big picture sense, um, and can't necessarily make sense of individual isolated bits of data. That was a big benefit. <clears throat> um, you've seen this diagram before, transforming the teacher toolkit. This is the one I showed in an earlier session, but it's a different version of it. As soon as you give creative teachers new tools to work with, your pedagogical um, repertoire increases. And that's got to be good. It stops the teachers being bored stops the students being bored because 
that will take you to um, a Xerti object. Now, sometimes you find different browsers don't always interact as you expect. So, okay, so what you should have is something inclusive social media. You've got horses for courses, and then there's a Google form embedded in this page. And then what you're going to be writing in there is how you will be supporting either Mustafa, Darren, Bella, Lindsay, Stefan, uh, Melanie, or Susie. So let's just go back to those profiles. <coughs> then spend five minutes or so just thinking what kind of social media type activities would you be able to use to support them? Now that might be supporting them academically in something, which is what I quite like to focus on, but if, if that's not what you do and you think, okay, I can't think of teaching context, then you might think something to do with student support or, or you know, some other aspect of personal life. So, those are the people. And you'll notice we've got not just, not just their um, disability, but we've got their personality, a little bit about their personality too. You've been able to pull together lots of stuff very quickly. And, and in fact, we, we're practicing what we're preaching. We're using inclusive social media. In this case, we're simply using an embedded Google form. But there's no reason why we couldn't have had something very similar set up for a discussion within a lecture um, theatre. And again, you know, that would be a really effective way of being able to pull together lots of different um, ideas from people. And it would also allow people to play to their strengths, because in here, you know, it may be that, let's imagine Russell was, was deaf, and so would find it difficult to communicate within a group. Although this way, he can put his thoughts up and have them there alongside everybody else. We've got supporting Stefan. Uh, so we've got for Stefan the dyslexic, field work and research. So there's our context. Identify different species using Padlet for note-taking, Instagram for additional images. Um, and then the thing, yeah, okay, really useful note there about Padlet, all of it will be disorganized notes until the end because then you can sort of pull things together on Padlet. Um, Instagram, multiple images not included in Padlet. Um, so we've got some potential almost caveats so if you're working this way, you would need to think about that. But again, what a great way of somebody being able to work um, just using their phone, having their notes taken there and then. They don't have to worry about, was it on this sheet of paper I did it, or was it on that sheet of paper? They know where it is and everybody's got their notes um, already. Lindsay, Emmy, so setting short tasks with an opportunity to achieve, motivating, helping to overcome tiredness. Use of Twitter with limited characters, well that's, yeah, that's going to be helpful if you're not asking to write great long sentences. Multiple choice forms, again, to encourage um, you know, easy responses, encourage concentration. Collaboration at a distance, Google Forms, Facebook, etc. So there's a lot of things there. Now again, um, there's no point in me reading through all of these um, because if I read through all of them, you might as well have told us what they were. But there's some a really good range of ideas there, which tells me that you know, you're getting your mindset into this sense of you know, how could we use social media very effectively. What I do, I'll give you the, the public URL for that. So, again, like this morning, we talked about, you know, you increase people's digital capacity, their digital capability, you give them more ways of creating more opportunities, <laughs> also more ways of creating more barriers if you get the kind of ignorance <coughs> level wrong, you know, if you forget to train them on the inclusion aspects. So here are one or two things that might go wrong. So you've got a great new app that you're using, you're encouraging all your students to use Mintimeter or to use... Um, Quizlet or any particular new app, thinking about Padlet. Okay, you're using in Padlet with everybody, but that's a possibility that you you use an app and devote a lot of teaching time and a lot of energy into using an app, and then afterwards you think, oh, I didn't realise that that was completely inaccessible. Um, here's another sort of issue where you know you have uh, I have this regularly on webinars and online training events, you've got this amazing, lively discussion going on in the text chat area, but if you are dyslexic and you take a long time to spell things to get the writing down there, or you've got a motor difficulty, you find that 
by the time the thread has moved way past what you're responding to, your response comes in in the middle of something completely different and it makes you look as if you're just not keeping up. So that can be an issue. Um, the final product includes videos and podcasts uh, that the deaf learner you're working with knows nothing about because they haven't, haven't got a clue what, it's, what either of them are saying. Um, or the guy with ASD, so you, you know, you've got this high-functioning Asperger's guy who's absolutely kind of brilliant on the technology and stuff, but social skill level is not particularly high. And he's just told the girl who's got anorexia, and now you've got factions based on free speech and social competence and things. So, okay, what are your responses to that? What are you going to do to minimise that? You need to be confident. I'm going to try something. I'm confident with the students um, to, to be able to say to the students, you know, I'm going to try this, it may not work. You'll notice before we did anything on that exercise we did a minute ago, I said to you, this may not work for all of you. Because it's true, it may not work for all of you. But I'm confident that if it all goes pear-shaped, uh, at least we will have tried, and, and maybe it'll go less pear-shaped next time because I'll find out what I did wrong. Sometimes you, you think to yourself, right, I want to do this kind of thing. Um, and you look around and there's half a dozen tools you could use, but you've got no idea which one's more accessible than the others. There's a website I'll show you which will, will give you a really good head start on that. So legal, you know, legal compliance, if there is, we, we talked about Padlet, for example. If there's something and you can justify your use of it, um, that's fine. I, I, uh, yeah, you can justify your use of it, that's absolutely fine. If there are two or three different things and you're using something that's patently terrible and there's perfectly good things that are really mainstream that you, know, you ought to have been expected to know about, then, then maybe you know, there is a duty of care to, to be aware of those. This is a website where it looks at, you look at things by either activity, what activity do you want to do? Um, so if we look at activities then you know, here are the sorts of things that I might want to do. Analyzing data, annotating multimedia, audio conferencing, audio video tools, blogging, microblogging. Let's take the blogging and microblogging. If I click on products and ratings, it then gives me scores for some of the tools. Now, what's interesting is that all the tools that you would expect aren't necessarily there. It's, it's a bit of a kind of um, hit and miss as to whether a specific tool is in there. But it, more importantly, it will give you, if the tool you want isn't there, it will give you the tests that they are applied. That there are these different tests, I think there's 14 tests, and it sounds like a lot, but actually they're, um, for anybody with a technical background, these are just very quick to do. An automated checker would do a lot of them for you. So it tells you what the tests are that they've used. You can do it by activity, so you can look down and say, pedagogically, I want to, a tool that does this, and then you can look for the tool, and then get any scores. But you can also, and this is a really interesting way of working, you can look by uh, disability. So if your issue is that actually you've got a class full of students um, where dyslexia is the, the key issue that you've got. You don't have anybody blind or deaf or anything else, you've just got a lot of dyslexics in there. You can have a look through and find out tests that are going to be, um, sorry, find out products that have scored particularly well, so, to, um, so specific learning difficulties. And what it will do is it will show you for that particular access need, of those 14 tests, for a dyslexic, these are the important ones. And these are the top 10 products that, that really fit that. If you've got a blind student, on the other hand, and your big issue is actually, I really don't know what I can use with this blind student, then you can go back up to the top and you can find a blind and severe visual impairment. So what are the tests that are important for them? Well, rather more, that's not surprising. Um, and what are the products that would work really well for them? Well, here's some of the really good easy chirp. That, that was what I would use for Twitter. It does Twitter, but it's a Twitter client. So I could still do Twitter-based things with my blind students. Um, 
And so this is, this is a really useful tool. That's web2access.org.uk. These are the 10 commandments um, of social media. Scott Hayne and Rachel Jans. <coughs> I'll just give you a little bit of background to this because this guy is working, he's not working in a university context. Scott Hayden is a tutor at Basingstoke College of Technology. He works in a media department, so he's working with a range of students who are doing media courses, and um, he doesn't actually use social media himself. I, I remember speaking to him and saying, you know, how much do you use this? Did you get into this because you're an avid social media user yourself? He's probably in his kind of late 20s, early 30s, but he said, no, I don't, personally, I, I don't do any of this stuff, but I have found it incredibly useful for my teaching. So all his accounts are teaching. He's got an Instagram account, a Twitter account, Snapchat account, um, Vine account, all these different accounts, but purely from a teaching and learning point of view. Um, and talking to him was real, a real eye-opener because I'll give you an example. Every one of his students has to set up a blog at the beginning of the course. Commandment number five, use social media as part of a meaningful learning experience. They also all have to set up a LinkedIn profile at the start of the course. He teaches them how to join LinkedIn discussion groups. He teaches them good etiquette. Um, so commandment number two, be positive, use of appraising, sharing things to inspire, etc. So they join LinkedIn discussions, professional LinkedIn discussions, and uh, or they follow blogs of other media professionals and they comment on them. They use positive comments, they share or inspire. The, he gets them on their blog to share good stuff that they find, social media command number nine, uh, to show curiosity in conversations, etc. What he said happens is that by the time the students have gone through the two years of their course, they have a very professional media profile online. They, have, they are actively following industry leaders. They are actively known by LinkedIn, in LinkedIn groups. They're actively known by professional organizations. And he said that that experience of creating that digital presence is often more significant for their employment prospects than the fact that you know they've, they've got a good grade at the end of the course. Because it means that when they are applying for courses or applying for, for jobs, that they can say, you know, here's my website, here's my Twitter stream, and if somebody looks on the Twitter stream, they've got a thousand followers or something, and they're media professionals that are following. Um, so that, I think, is really important. There's some really important caveats in here as well, apart from don't expect everything to work all the time. Uh, I like this one. Um, he's very strong on this, always be the grown-up. And he, he, there's two aspects of this I'll explain. One is that he, he finds it completely um, unacceptable when other members of staff in the organisation um, kind of Post, post comments online on their Facebook profiles that you know, the students are following and so on, put comments online like, you know, going down the pub tonight for a bender or something. He says that's, you know, you should be, make sure that you are practicing what you preach, make sure you're modeling good practice. But he says you always need to be the grown up in the room. And if you're using this kind of stuff in a professional way, you need to be professional about the way you use it. Uh, and then the, the other element that's part of that, which is, um, I found a very interesting element, is that his head of department, so his line manager, has the account um, details for every one of the accounts that this guy uses. So anybody can get on there at any time, or not anybody, but any, his line manager can go on at any time, can see what's happening, um, and, and basically, it's a, it's a process of trust. He's saying, look, I'm doing this professionally. Here are my account details. This is the password. This is the login detail. So you know that you know, if anything happens or if anything goes wrong, you can 
track it and troubleshoot as much as I can. So that's, that's a really interesting example. It's one of the best examples, I think, of the use of social media that I've come across. So how about understanding and communicating the benefits uh, to learners? Now, that takes us exactly to where we were at the end of both sessions this morning, which is okay, fantastic stuff we can do here. How do we communicate this? to staff, how do we communicate it to students? Well, life has been made slightly easier for you because there's a really good project, a nice online tool called uh, the Student Guide to Social Media. And that's been put together by uh, Manchester University. And here, these are just a few quotes from it. It takes you through lots of different types of social media. So, There's lots of different elements there, so I, I just clicked on the, um, on the Keep Up To Date one. What can I use? Social media tools, what can I use to, to do any of these things, develop my online presence, keep up to date. Let's go back to Keep Up To Date. So there's a bit of a section on that, and then the blog section of this resource, the Twitter section, Google Plus, YouTube, you can click on any of those. For Twitter, what is it? Why use it? using it well, and each of these again is, you know, is clickable, next steps, how you go about getting into Twitter. So, to be honest, I think that might be useful to use with a lot of your staff, because, um, you know, if your digital capacity work, digital capability work is going to start, it probably doesn't need to start with students, it probably needs to start with staff, but there's some good uh, information in there. So there's a number of little videos where students are saying what's happened, how they used it. And one of the nice things about this is that when you think back to the example we did with the personas you know, 20 minutes ago, these are some of the sorts of things you were thinking about. Um, so useful learning resources, collaborating, helping each other on difficult homework problems, uh, increasing cohesion, um, getting feedback from people on your course, revising from Facebook, that's interesting, uh, following the right people, um, good articles about current research, and so on. So this is, that's a way of um, you know, promoting it to learners, or indeed promoting it to staff. Accessibility is, as we've suggested already, an issue, potentially. Facebook's got some really good accessibility guidance, uh, various keyboard shortcuts uh, for people either with motor difficulties or non-mouse users, like screen reader users. A whole section on using Facebook with screen readers and assistive technology. Um, Facebook for Android, Facebook for iPhone are particularly accessible because they they lock into the inbuilt uh, text-to-speech and so on on those devices. Easy to accessible um, Twitter. There's an accessible YouTube, and we talked already about Web2 access. MOOCs, I'll probably not do anything on MOOCs now, because I think that's probably a step too far at the moment. Vested um, self-interest, I think I'll pass over as well. What I want to do just in the last few minutes is <clears throat> leave this and just have a look at some possibilities that uh, we could play with, get you looking at some things that you can do. These aren't necessarily uh, exactly social media, but they're um, ways of using the student's own devices. So tinyurl.com slash IET include is a place I'd like you to go to. If For your own vested self-interest, you know, the JISC has done some top 10 social media influencers. NSE has done some sort of top academic tweeters. In terms of keeping up to date yourselves, these may be people worth following, either on their blogs or on their tweeting. Uh, there are some nice uh, tools here. There's uh, how to use crowdsourcing as a research tool. There's some really new opportunities opening up in the social sciences with uh, social media uh, as a research tool. Um, uh, we've got oh, survey mappers. Yeah, this is quite an interesting tool, creating your own surveys. Uh, there's loads of ways you can create surveys, but this one, I think, uh, 
has some very nice spatial elements to it. I was interested as a geographer. And then JISC has got some guidance. But again, that's, you, know, you can have the links for that later. So I think the very last slide of this is just to say thank you for your attention. <laughs>